Timer starts now. Okay, great. So uh, this is for beginners in machine learning, and uh, if you know a lot of about machine learning, maybe it's a little bit boring, but you never know. So uh, first of all, I'm talking about decision boundaries, but I have to explain what that is. Um, look at this data sheet here, and each of these spots uh, it represents one data point, and uh, one axis is age, and the other is max speed, and it's about uh, car insurances and accidents. And if you have a red spot, it means probably a lot of accidents. A green spot means not, not so many, and, and uh, the yellow spot is somewhere in the middle. Now, what you can do to separate these groups from each, from each other is that you draw something by hand, in this case. And I'm, I'm drawing this red line, I'm separating the red spots from the green ones. And next thing is I'm separating the yellow spots uh, from the green ones, and le this leaves me with the, with the green ones. And I did this by hand. And I did this to have the point that the, um, the lines that I drew, they are the decision boundaries. That's, that's how you could call them. So their boundaries, they, they divide one group of these data points from another. And this might all by itself be interesting, but that's not the point of, the, of this lightning talk, but the point is, um, how would these uh, decision boundaries look like if I applied different machine learning strategies? And this is all about supervised machine learning. So you put in some data and you train it, and I did some grid search and random search to find the best solution for each machine learning strategy. And uh, so what you typically also do is you have a baseline to get an idea of how well you're doing, and that baseline is just silly. That's just a random classifier that I wrote and it's 33% accurate. So if you just guess, 33%. So you should be better. And then I did something also uh, classified by hand. And this is just a few coded rules, and it might look like this, and this is around uh, 43%. So now, different machine learning strategies. So just to give you an idea how they might, might look like if they did the same thing. And decision trees, if they did their best, it might look like this. So, a little bit like the hand-coded, but more blocks. Um, not too bad. Um, then, random forest, which is an ensemble of decision trees, which looks better. And you can see if the, the decision boundaries are smooth, that's probably good. If they're like blocks, probably not so good. Um, K-nearest neighbor, uh, that's how they look. There's a certain figure, but not perfect, but not so bad. Now, support vector machines. It used to be like the, the, the hottest stuff that you could do before there was uh, um, neural networks. And that looks really nice. And if you look at these, these decision boundaries for a long time, you actually can, can uh, make, a, make a judgment of how well the classification worked by just looking at figures like these. And this looks really good. It's smooth, uh, not very many, many separated classes, very nice. And this, uh, now with neural networks, it's very hard to see the difference even going back, forward. Uh, support vector machine might be a little bit better, but they're both really good at it. So um, if that's interesting for you, I've prepared a poster. Well, it's not really a poster. I, did, I had never done a poster, and I thought that might be a good poster. Then I looked at all the other posters, and then I thought, well, <laughs> I should have done this, but now I did that. So um, maybe, maybe you still like it. It's over there, and you might come there. And I prepared a notebook that created all these poster segments, uh, and it's also available, you can play with it, um, and with that, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Oliver. I, I think that was a poster child of a poster. <laughs> no, 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 no takers? Oh, okay, well, how about this one? Um, I always found support vector machines kind of very, very annoying. Very annoying. <laughs> uh, and uh, next uh, on deck, we have uh, DJ Donahue. DJ, DJ, are you in the audience? Yeah. All right. And setting up is Martin Bruttles. Okay. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, FEX, which is an outer core data frame library for, uh, for Python. 
so what is it? It looks a little bit like uh, pandas. It is pandas-like data frame, but for a really large data set. It's using memory mapped columnar data. Uh, so many of the things are similar to what, uh, what Wes was talking about today. Uh, it has a zero memory copy policy because I assume large, uh, a really large data set. And a strong point of it is uh, statistics on n-dimensional grids. It can do something like a billion rows uh, per second. And visualization is built in. So let's import it and take a look at this data set, which is 23 gigabytes large. My laptop has 16. And let's open this. And it's pretty fast. So, because it's only doing memory mapping. And what you see, it has 146 million rows. And um, so it's really Pandas-like, so you can access the underlying NumPy array, which is a memory map NumPy array. But it doesn't have series, it has something called expressions. And with the expressions, you can do like calculations, but it doesn't waste any memory. So for instance, one column would cost like a gigabyte, but now it's actually just storing this expression and gives you some preview uh, value. And that's basically a, a strong point of effects using expressions everywhere. So instead of wasting like memory, uh, it just uh, uses the expression system. And you can also store these expressions as a new column. So I now add a new column to this data frame. And it works like a regular column, except that it doesn't cost any memory. So now you have a new column, tip percentage. And you can use it as any column, so you can calculate what, what the mean of this is. So 10% is about the uh, uh, average tip. So I took this point uh, from uh, Wes, where if you write this expression, it makes a copy of this uh, data frame if you use pandas. So I'm, I'm writing here something similar, which would use 46 gigabytes if it was a pandas data frame. Uh, and in fact, this wouldn't be possible. Um, uh, so well, actually, in fact, it's possible. and it, doesn't use any memory. It just keeps track of which rows are uh, uh, selected and calcula calculates on that. So let's go into the n-dimensional statistics so you can count how many rows there are and say, well, instead of group by, which is really expensive, I have something called bin by where you do it on a regular, uh, a regular bin. And you can calculate, so uh, say, a two-dimensional histogram and show this. So this looks like Manhattan. Or if this is not good enough, you uh, use an interactive version. So this is built on BQplot, and it calculates this every time that you zoom in. Uh, kind of like data shader. We have similar IDs on this. Uh, and now you can do a visual selection. So I'm selecting the airports, airport trips. And this you can also use to calculate statistics. Again, making no memory copies. So you see that it doesn't pay off to, uh, uh, if you want tips to go to the uh, airport. So let's say I have this function, which is assuming NumPy arrays to calculate what the distance is on a great circle. So you can put in numbers instead of NumPy arrays. So I'm uh, uh, from Groningen, so I'm 5,000 miles from home. Uh, but you can also pass these, uh, uh, these expressions, and nothing gets calculated. So a new column gets added, which is like a virtual column, which is this huge expression. And there's, of course, a price to pay. So if you have a simple expression, like this tip percentage, just a division, it's uh, pretty, uh, um, it doesn't cost so much time. But this expression is really expensive. It's like a, a, a repeated expression here, cosine, arctan, and that's some, taking something like nine seconds. But because we have this expression system, we can say, okay, let's uh, uh, ask Numba or Python to optimize this. And then we get a speed of, of a factor of something like two. So that's what FAX is. It's a, uh, it has a known API like Pandas. It's uh, uh, pretty fast in doing the statistics. And because of these expressions, instead of uh, a direct computation, you're not wasting any RAM. And you can do things like just-in-time compilation, uh, more complicated things like derivatives. And something we're trying out now with machine learning is that you don't have to have a pipeline, because everything you're doing, every calculation, et cetera, is recorded in the data set. And uh, another interesting feature is that you can have remote data sets because we're not transporting data, just the expressions and the statistics. Um, that's uh, uh, also a nice feature. And my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. I know whenever I try to get around to New York, I always consult my memory map. So, Ooh, burn. Oh, yeah. there we go. Thank you. Um, uh, so, go ahead, set up DJ. Uh, Matt Rocklin is on deck. Who? 
Matt Rocklin. Do doesn't, no, yeah. Mm, whom? I, I, whom? Whom? Okay. Sorry, take it away, DJ. Well, I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is that I have no setup, so this will be quick. The bad news is that you're going to have to stare at this ugly mug for five minutes. So I'm going to be doing a talk about something a little bit more conceptual, and I found out that I was going to be doing this about an hour ago, so there's no slides. Um, but my name is DJ Donahue. I'm with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, and I'm a PhD economist. So what's going on right now? Is there a timer somewhere I can see? No? Okay. So that, that would be much appreciated. Um, one of the buzzwords right now in healthcare management is the idea of care management, of taking care of things before they become problems. And so as part of this, predictive analytics teams are starting to pop up in healthcare pairs all over the country. We're trying to find out things that even people who don't know that they've got the condition, that they have the condition from their other claims, from their other conditions. And as part of this, what we're trying to do now is to get nurses in contact with people. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> You know, you think it would work out like with a screen or something, but uh, ah, never mind. So we get nurses, we get them in contact with people, and so that we can make sure they get the proper care, the proper preventative care. Because this is based on the whole idea of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The problem is, where do you put that ounce of prevention? So predictive modeling comes into play now. And we build these predictive models, we try and find out who's got diabetes before their toes start falling off. Uh, who's actually got a, uh, a woman who is pregnant before the baby actually gets born, so we can make sure that the baby gets healthy, the person with diabetes gets their treatment necessary, all with the idea of reducing future costs by putting in a little bit of effort early on. The issue is that when it comes to healthcare, path dependency is a huge thing. We have old legacy systems. We've got old versions of DB2. We've got older versions of Sybase, SQL Server, all these different things. And so the question becomes, how do we make these work better? Thank you. One of the processes that we're starting to implement now is the utilization of parallel processing databases, things like Dar uh, Teradata, the new DB Blue system that IBM is supposedly coming out with. We haven't seen it yet, but we've heard it's in pipeline. And the old method has always been such that you take data from your database, pull it down to a computer, work on it, push the uh, the answer is back out to the database and repeat as needed. The problem is that this version of ETL, this pulling down data, takes a lot of time, especially with older legacy data systems. So what do we do now? Well, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee is working with a company called Fuzzy Logics, not Fuzzy Logic, which is a method, but a company Fuzzy Logics. Their specialization is creating user-defined functions which sit inside parallel processing databases like Teradata such that all you have to do is push SQL into the database and it takes advantage of the multi-node architecture to actually do the modeling in database. We're starting to see this now such that we are seeing vast improvements in modeling time, whereas one of our old models used to take about uh, four and a half hours to run start to finish, and now it takes about 20 minutes because it takes advantage of parallel processing. And so that's what we're doing now. We're gonna start moving this towards other fields I can't show you any actual data or give you any real numbers because, well, HIPAA. Healthcare, it's a thing. But we are excited to have this happen. We are excited to see where it's going to go and what kind of efficiencies it can produce further into the future. Uh, that's less than five minutes, but I'm going to quit bugging you now. Thank you much. Thanks a lot, DJ. Up next is Matt Rockland. And on deck is Hannah. We're in the room a minute ago, hopefully. She might have just stepped up. Okay. Um, hopefully she'll come back uh, before that. So alternatively Nathan. Alternatively Nathan. She's here. She's there. Okay, great. Perfectly. All right, take it away, Matt. I, I would, but it's not protecting my monitor, unfortunately. Max? Yeah. Do, do you want me to take your laptop away? No. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm going to unplug it. <laughs> come on. Come on. Wait, the, you, the you comment just from have the audience was slide. that the last guy gave a great presentation without a, a laptop. Okay. Let's try just adding a dongle and see if that helps. No? You know, with, with, with your slides, I'm feeling kind of blue, Matt. No? Maybe move on to the next person? Uh, yeah, we can rotate you around. 
from the audience. You blew that joke. All right, we're gonna we're gonna move in, Hana, just for the moment, and then hopefully we'll get back to Hana saves the day as always. Woo! I'm sure you would have wanted to see that talk. Um, maybe not. I have an HD. I have a VGA and. Yo, which is after do I use for my lovely Mac? Uh, yeah, so where? What do we have here? Oh, this is the one. Oh, so. No. That's not the one? Oh, no, that's the USB. Here, isn't this one? Uh, that's mine. Oh, that's mine. But yours? it's VGA. Oh, it's VGA. Sorry. The problem is, I need slides because mine's a visualization thing. Do we have. Hey. I would. Do you have a white? No, no more. Dan Allen saves the day. Thank you. No, this is VGA. We need. Uh, That's mine. HDMI. HDMI. Right? Would you want to hear Dan? <laughs> Dan saves the day. Uh, we actually no. Max, we need so just a million dollars, Dan. Just a million dollars. That's all we need. <laughs> also, a warning: if you have a Mac. Well, we really need our two two podiums, but you know. But we're cheap, yeah. Who can afford right, it? Yeah, we're a podium. Great. Oh, yeah. Woo! Okay. Uh, okay. I have five minutes. Not yet. Wait. Not yet. Yay! Okay. Go. Raise your hand if you've had to. If you've seen the Amnesty. The mic, the mic. Sorry. Raise your hand. How many of you have seen the Amnesty example today? Okay. Those don't know. Amnesty is the database. It's the Numbers. It's the digitized images of numbers that's used for everyone to teach machine learning. So I'm going to go through how I explain linear classification parameters, parameter shifting using MNIST. So, step one, import all the things. Done. Step, yeah. <laughs> step two, right, we're going to tr create a training, create a test. In this case, I use the raw gzip files instead of SK Learn built in because I'm a masochist. Don't. If you have to, though, this is how you do it. Read in everything, use this, go back down to C, dump them into our dictionaries. More of this kind of man grab the binaries. Okay, so we're going to do a billion classifier. In this case, we're going to do the simplest linear. Linear classifier, everything is a zero or one. Actually, a negative one and a one. There's a boundary. Okay, first things first is I'm going to take all my MNIST, put everything in a zero to one scale. And I'm going to, cl I'm going to do my training label. In this case, I'm going to be very simple here because it's a Boolean classifier. Are you a zero or are you not a zero? Everything that is a zero, is going to be one. Everything that's not a zero is going to be negative one. And so I want my classifier to just find zeros. Then I use sklearn because I'm lazy. <laughs> going to run it, going to predict it, going to make this big. So this is wise and I love it, but it's cranky. And this is all on GitHub if you actually want it. Then I check that, every, that what my algorithm is doing because this is for teaching. So image on the right is the MNIST. Image um, with a zero to one is my training data, one of my training samples. Um, everything on the blue scale is in the one direction. Everything in the red scale is on the negative scale. And the black and white image is the decision boundary. That's the coefficient. So what you're going to do is you do a, to find out if something's a classification, you multiply the raw image, the data, with the coefficients. And if your net is positive, that's a zero. If your net is negative, it's not a zero. That's how the linear classification works. And this is all in beautiful matplotlib. And then I want to actually show, change the alpha, what happens. So I write a bunch of matplotlib, write a little bit more code, and I get this. And so this is a decision histogram. The histogram, the orange histogram is our not a zero. The blue histogram is our zero. 
the everything in the blue shade is that's what our algorithm is going to predict it's a Z, uh, one. Everything in the other, in the yellow, is what algorithm is not going to predict. And so we're going to use SK um, Apple Live to show, hey, when I adjust the alpha, this is what happens to the decision boundary. I'm going to, it keeps shifting, the, it keeps shifting where the classifier is, so now I get more false positives and more false negatives. And then, because I want this to be tweetable, I save it to a GIF. Okay? And I have no battery left, so perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Le leave it to a core Matplotlib developer to show us the most Pythonic of all plots, the histogram. Histogram. Up next, we have Matt Rockland. No, okay, okay, yeah, we can go with, we can, we, we can go with Nathan. Nathan, you ready? Uh, sorry to throw you under the plot, I guess. Um, oh. Uh, and then, uh, up next on deck will be Dan. Oh, I see you. Yeah, there you are. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen this talk before. The blank one? Okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking about UNIT, which is a new library that's based on what was yt.units uh, that we've now extracted from YT and made available to the community. So if you're unfamiliar with yt.units or any other Python package that handles units, just a quick introduction. It turns your Python prompt into a super-powered physics calculator. So uh, the top here, we are, we're importing some, some symbols from UNIT, the mass of Jupiter, the gravitational constant, in the unit kilometer, and uh, we, plug, we feed in some data, which I got from Wikipedia, for the semi-major axes of the orbits of the Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and then we plug it into this formula, which you might be familiar from high school physics, that tells you what the period of a circular orbit is, and then convert, convert the result to days, and we get an answer, and uh, if you look up what the orbital periods of the Galilean moons, these are indeed the correct answers. So how does this work? Let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So first, we import some things from unit. Uh, let's look at what G is. G, it turns out, is a quantity. It has a, a scalar value, so 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11, and it has some units, which are some complicated expressions, some complicated combination of other units, meters, cubed, uh, kilograms, and seconds. Uh, we can also look at what, what's kilometer. It's an instance of a unit object, which is defined inside of the unit itself. Uh, we, in th things in the YT project don't get names unless, they're, unless they have four different meanings and uh, are also a pun. So, uh, yeah, so we can like multiply a list or uh, any other array-like thing with kilometers to get back an array with units of kilometers, and then we can convert that to a different unit that has the same dimensions. Um, another cool thing about units is, uh, about unit is that we track the dimensions, so for example, uh, Actually, here, backing up a little bit, let's talk about uh, how this, this big complicated formula works. So you, you see we, we plug in uh, some, some mathematical expression that has some powers and some square roots, and we get back so, an answer that is in some sort of messy units, but we can look at the dimensions of those units and we know that this has dimensions of time. So let's convert that to days and we get an answer. It's great, yay. So unit has minimal dependencies, and it's written in pure Python. Um, it only depends on NumPy and SymPy. That's a lie. On Python 2.7, it also depends on uh, the LRU cache backport, but who cares about Python 2.7? Um, unit, in particular, it does not depend on YT at all. So if you want to use yt.units, if you've ever used it in the past and you think it's really cool, uh, you can now use it completely extracted from YT, and it's, it's its own package, and we are, we're hopeful that the rest of the community will, will, will pick it up. Uh, you might be familiar with both Pint and AstroPy.Units as well as some other packages. Uh, there was a talk in SciPy 2013 from Trevor Bekele who did a big review of all these packages. Why not use one of the existing ones? Well, well first, uh, we developed all these packages sort of at the same time, so there's a, there's a sort of an example of convergent evolution. Um, and then also, Unit is nice in a, in a number of ways. First, uh, it's a much smaller code base. You can see it's got about 5,000 lines of code, and including tests, it's only about 3,000 lines of code. Uh, it also has much higher test coverage. It turns out that uh, 
uh, you know, as you might expect, if you uh, test, increase test coverage correlates with lower amounts of bugs and, and issues. It's also faster than unit AstroPi or Pint, uh, or sorry, than AstroPi.units or Pint. In this, in this uh, figure, I'm showing timings for various operations, so like equal equal, A over B, multiplication, uh, subtraction and addition, and I'm showing for input arrays that have elements of size three, 10 to the three, and 10 to the six, and that's coded by, uh, by the, the shading of the, each of those bars. So for small inputs, uh, the, the overhead, or the, the time to complete this operation over the time it took NumPy to do that operation, so without tracking any units at all. And this is a log scale, so you can see that for a lot of these operations, unit is, is like tens of times fat, is, is multiple, is uh, two or three or four, five times faster than some of the other packages. Um, and even for, for example, for Pint, for, a, for comparison operators, I think this is a bug in Pint, even for really large arrays, uh, there's still s s substantial overhead for just tracking the unit metadata. Um, if you want to install Unit, just use it with pip or conda, or conda, where it's up on Conda Forge. The documentation is available on Read the Docs. Our code is on GitHub, and uh, we've submitted a, a paper to Joss uh, describing Unit and presenting some of these performance benchmarks that I showed in the previous slide. So if you want to know more details, look at the Joss paper. Thank you, Nathan. Let the bad spellers of the world unite. Nice. Uh, all right, he's laughing, that's all that Just matters. a question for Nathan, what's your pluribus factor? What? E, e pluribus punum? It's just a single we're, question. We're moving on to Matt, so. <laughs> Take it away, Matt. Eventually, okay. yes, there we go. So let's see, so uh, I'm gonna talk about, oh, first I'm gonna get out a timer. They're already going on me, aren't they? Yeah, so I'm going to talk about how to turn your supercomputer into an interactive workstation. So I mostly work on Dask. Uh, Dask runs on like the cloud. It runs on Hadoop clusters very recently. It also runs on supercomputers. Many people here have access to some institutional cluster at their university, at their job, at their secret covert government lab. Uh, and so usually, so I have a key. I'm going to log into my supercomputer here. So I'm going to SSH. So, and I'm going to type in this. So this is what people might do at home. And then usually you might do something like MPI run, or you might QSub a bunch of jobs, and you'll go home for the day, and you'll come back when your run is done. Instead, I run a new command, the Jupyter lab command. Uh, it's a little bit different, though, because I'm on a different remote machine, so I don't want a browser. And I also am going to access it uh, from a different, different address than it's used to. So great, I'm now running Jupyter, so now I can log into that remotely and play around a little bit. Uh, however, I can't talk in, I can't just type in here, you know, supercomputer. Um, <laughs> so instead I'm gonna do another trick, I'm gonna uh, SSH uh, tunnel. This is gonna give me, I'm gonna map the port 8888 on Cheyenne 2, and another port 8787 to be used by Dask in a moment. Yeah. It doesn't really matter that you see it. The, the fun things will come in a moment. So if you do these things, this is now allowing, uh, I'm gonna log in, it's now allowing my local machine to access those ports on the supercomputer uh, happily. So now I can go to, instead of supercomputer, I can go to localhost, 8080, 8080. Now I have JupyterLab. JupyterLab, not on my local machine, but I have JupyterLab actually on the cluster, so I can you know, open up a notebook and I can do things like one plus one if I wanted to. Uh, or I can open up a terminal. Uh, and I have, you know, this is, this is not my laptop, this is the supercomputer, I can do df-h, and you can see in there there's like, you know, petabyte scale hard drives. <laughs> um, so, also fun things you can do. So I'm using JupyterLab here, not a normal Jupyter notebook. This is especially valuable because I, uh, like having a terminal, I like having a file browser. I can go and look at my space. I can take this notebook here on my laptop's desktop. Oops. And I can click and drag it onto the supercomputer. Right. So what, what was previously a pain now becomes more pleasant. Okay. So one of the things I wanna do, I'll play with Dask, and I'm going to launch a Dask cluster here. 
and we're going to ask for 20 machines, well, 19 machines maybe. And what that is done is that has asked for 20 nodes on that cluster to be running to ask. It'll take a moment for those nodes to show up. Let's go watch for them here. And again, I would normally look for this by logging into a terminal and typing qstat -u -m Rocklin. And we can see that they are queued up. And now I'm really nervous because someone else might be using this machine. And we're just going to sort of wait here nervously. <laughs> but on the left, we should hopefully see some workers show up soon. In the meantime, I'll show you some documentation. This is the Ask Job Queue. <laughs> In a moment, workers are going to show up here. We'll all be very happy. There'll be a ooh from the crowd. So this Dask job queue allows you to launch clusters, e launch Dask easily on a supercomputer. Uh, it's very easy to use. It does require some, some friendliness from the cluster. Uh, it's not actually written by me. It's written by mostly other people in this room. If you like Guillaume, uh, Loic, uh, and Joe Hammond. Uh, and if we're lucky, come on, supercomputer. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Come on. <laughs> Come on. If anyone is using Cheyenne right now and you can kill some jobs, I would really appreciate it. My question is, where's Moore's Law when you need it, huh? This is practical with HPC, basically. But we can then do things like allocate a terabyte array, and we can sum that array in a couple seconds, and it's very fun. Uh, there's a nice video, if you go to Dash Job Queue, it actually goes through in 30 minutes, walking through the entire process of building configuration, using Dash Job Queue, setting things up, and I'm done. And thank you, Matt. <laughs> Hashtag, my local host is a supercomputer. <laughs> and by supercomputer, you mean Raspberry Pi, right? <laughs> right? From the audience. From the. All right, thanks, Matt. Uh, up next, we have Dan Allen, and then after Dan, is it uh, Gina? Gina. All right. Thanks. Great. Give it a minute. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Many, uh, many scientists that I work with and know who don't necessarily regularly compute uh, or regularly contribute to open source projects or maintain an open source projects have started to accumulate Python scripts in some directory somewhere, or more and more nowadays, Jupyter notebooks with lots and lots of code that starts to burst the seams of the document abstraction in the notebook. And there's a lot of copy pasting, and they get themselves into knots where they're, they're not really sure how to clean up the mess that they're starting to accumulate in their, uh, in their home directories on their computers. And I work in a group whose role is to help capture scientific code and make it more maintainable and shareable and, and usable. The SciPy ecosystem obviously has a lot to offer here. We have tooling, we have conventions and best practices for uh, packaging and, and organizing and documenting code, but there's a big activation energy for the average scientist who knows some Python to kind of buy into that whole system, especially if they haven't yet encountered all of the problems that this tooling is supposed to solve. Uh, so enter the scientific Python cookie cutter. If you don't know, uh, Cookie Cutter is uh, a project created and maintained by Audrey Roy. It's kind of like Mad Libs for creating directories full of files. So real quickly to just look at an example, you would, oops, I want to be here. Bigger. Yeah, give it a second. I'll, when I find it, I'll blow it up. How's that? So you, you run this one line in your, in your bash command prompt, and then it asks you a bunch of questions, like what's the name of the module that you want to create, and so on. And then it dumps onto your disk a directory full of boilerplate with Mad Lib style uh, you know, names, names filled in. So there are many Python cookie cutter templates. I link to them in this documentation. Uh, they range from extremely minimalist to kitchen sink. 
uh, but I'm not aware of one that specifically mimics the conventions and the tooling that you find in projects like Pandas and Dask and Matplotlib, a SciPy specific Python cookie cutter that tries not to have an overwhelming amount of tooling in it that someone would feel like they didn't need or couldn't understand, but also be a little bit more than, than minimalist. I think the most important thing about this project is the documentation about it. Uh, we're trying to lead people toward good practices and we're starting right from the beginning of sign up for a GitHub account and getting all the way to publishing your project on, on uh, PyPI and setting up Travis CI integration. Uh, this is an opinionated tutorial. It, it tries to lead people down one path that works for a small to medium sized uh, scientific project maintained by a small group. Just to give you a sense for what's here, we're trying to get people off on the right foot. Here's an, an example function that we show. This is Snell's law encoded in Python. And you can see right from the start, we have a doc string with numpy doc compliant doc strings. And we don't let them get too far before we encourage them to write a test and talk about some of the patterns that are useful for doing that. We also include in the cookie cutter Sphinx extensions and expose people to a lot of the uh, common extensions to Sphinx that are nice in SciPy documentation, like the interactive IPython examples, Matplotlib plots, and LaTeX math. Finally, we have some guiding design principles, some lessons learned. As we work with scientists to try and standardize their code, we see a lot of people making the same mistakes again and again. Some of these things are, are social, like encouraging people to collaborate uh, from the start. Some of them are more technical, and they're drawing on patterns that I think the SciPy community at large has has adopted and lessons it's learned over time. So this uh, is only about a three week old project. We're very interested in input on this, especially this guiding design principles piece and any feedback on usability. One glaring omission here is any mention of compiled extensions, which obviously would be good to address. So if you're inspired to help, pull requests are welcome. Uh, finally, uh, we'd really like people to use it especially if you have a summer student and you want that student to be exposed to the patterns and the tooling. I think if I had gone through this, I would have become more confident to try contributing to an open source project earlier. So I'm hoping that that would help. Uh, also, if you have a postdoc on their way out the door soon and you want to capture their work in some maintainable way, this might be good for that. And that's my time. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, but you lost me at Bash. I didn't understand yeah, what that yeah, was about. Yeah, we'll so. get there. <laughs> All right. Uh, up next, we have Gina. And then uh, next on decks is Paul. Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, Chris Holgraf. Oh, that was, that was directed at me? Is, that it, am was I, direct, yeah, yeah, I'm is sorry. this thing on? Am I? You have, you have to keep what, sharp. Where, where am I? It's, oh, am I? You're, you're spared a pun. It's coming. Or maybe not. Hey. OK. Hello, I'm Gina Helfrich. I do communications and run the diversity and inclusion program at NumFocus. Uh, I was to have to talk to you about the diversity and inclusion program, uh, which we call DISC for short, diversity and inclusion in scientific computing. Uh, so that's what I will be discussing today. Puns, uh, what's up? All right, anyway. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you so much, all right. I'm wasting my time. Uh, so uh, I am pleased to share with you what we have been up to, what we are working on now, who all is involved, and how you can uh, learn more. Uh, the program is aimed at improving uh, representation and inclusion of underrepresented people in scientific computing. We believe that that creates better science and better projects. And there's quite a lot of research out there to that effect. Um, Diversity in open source is poor, poor, poor. Uh, there's also, frankly, not a lot of great uh, data out there about demographics in open source. The uh, GitHub survey that this article references has, I think, about 5,000 respondents. Uh, so it's really not that many people. Nevertheless, uh, some highlights. It's about 95% male, 1% uh, of respondents identify as trans, and uh, women are more likely than men to encounter language or content that makes them feel unwelcome. So we have work to do, for sure. The work that we have been doing uh, since sort of formally organizing as a committee last March 
uh, is as follows. We put together a cookbook, it's on GitHub, please check it out and contribute uh, to support people who are organizing events to make them more diverse and inclusive. Uh, I genuinely know that it's not by any means comprehensive and so please go there and help us to make it even better as a community effort. Uh, we developed a post-event survey. In particular, we've been uh, implementing it at PyData conference events to assess attendee experiences and see if there are differences between the responses from people who self-identify as underrepresented and others. Uh, we've been collecting that info since the spring of last year. And we hosted an unconference in November, um, co-hosted at PyData New York uh, for the DISC program. We had about 40 participants and they put together, we put together uh, eight projects which you can read about and check out also on GitHub and I also have a blog series on the NumFocus site highlighting each project so I encourage you to look there. Uh, and if you are real nerdy about the details of what we've been up to, you can read all our meeting minutes <laughs> online. <laughs> Um, so here's what we're doing now. Uh, we are focused on improving the UX and usability of the Discover cookbook um, because we have told people it exists, but I know from the insights that it still doesn't seem to be getting that many hits. Um, so I think that finding some ways to make it easier to use will really help on that score. So we're working on turning it into more of a website as opposed to just a repo and um, some downloadable checklists, et cetera. Uh, we have a subcommittee that's working on assessment, sort of very broadly construed, uh, and doing some deep diving on best practices for how to collect diversity demographics, uh, because there are a number of ethical issues around that um, as well. And then community engagement through collaborative events. We have a subcommittee working on events that can help us to pull in new people who may be currently up underrepresented in the community, um, including, for example, uh, an event in the works with Deb Collar and the New York Times, maybe some worldwide sprints. We've been very inspired by some of the things happening in the community lately. This is the current DISC committee. So I work with these folks. We meet on a regular basis and everyone works on one or more subcommittees. So feel free to reach out. I know some of us are here, including Julie and Medikin. And if you want to learn more, I invite you to go to the website, join our mailing list, participate in the conversations tomorrow. I will definitely be there. Uh, and I should mention that we're very grateful to the Moore Foundation for funding, in part, our work. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Great late my talk. Paul, this is your time to shine. How, how, how can I do that? I think you could tell us who the next person is. It's, it's Chris, he's making his way. Oh, 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 I see, I see. Okay, uh, so uh, up next is uh, Alex, uh, talking about Dive Bomb, which should be on deck. And uh, so this is, I'm also gonna a little bit maybe uh, embarrass Chris Holgraf, who's, who's a friend, um, which is what I do to friends. So if you ever wanna, which is why I have so few. Who was a friend. Who was, well, a, was friend. a friend. Who was yeah. a friend until recently, in fact, just now. Um, but. Um, the instructions for the lightning talk sign up sheet is that it's one talk per person um, and, uh, and, and, and Chris signed up for two. So I'm hoping he knows that and he may want to squeeze in two talks into this one or he's doing his favorite one because he's giving one. But the, so the second talk is more like a ghost talk because okay. I'm really giving it for UV Panda. Okay, got it. Um, okay, so my name is Chris Holgraf. I'm a fellow at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, and I also work with the Berkeley uh, Data Science Education Program, uh, both at UC Berkeley. Um, and I want to talk quickly about a project that I've been working on that's been a collaboration between the two of them uh, that I call Textbooks with Jupyter and Jekyll. Um, for anyone who's curious, the link to these slides is just there on the bit.ly link below. It's just Textbooks with Jupyter SciPy. Um, so at Berkeley, one of the big driving forces behind Jupyter Hub developments um, has been this gigantic course that you may have heard of called Data 8. This is a, basically an introduction to data analytics uh, course called Foundations in Data Science. 
It's roughly 1,400 students large. It's meant for first year undergraduates, so people that have minimal to no background in scientific computation, programming, statistics, visualization, all of that stuff. Um, and yet, they have set up a Jupyter Hub that all of the students can interact with all of the course material so that they can you know, get their hands dirty and, and uh, learn a bit by doing. Um, and so my first gratuitous shout out is, if you're curious about how we do that with a Jupyter Hub at Berkeley, check out z2jh.jupyter.org, which is a relatively complete tutorial on how you can deploy your own uh, Jupyter Hub on Kubernetes at scale. Um, so the textbook that the course uses, as well as all of the course material, are all written with Jupyter notebooks. Um, so for those of you who know, notebooks are really great for interweaving narrative as well as code and for courses like Data8. Um, but notebooks don't really exist in a way that they know about each other, which is a little bit tricky if you want to sort of combine all of them together to create something like a textbook. Um, moreover, the course, as I mentioned before, it integrates fairly heavily with the Jupyter Hub, um, and it also uses another service uh, that you may have heard of that I've heard is super cool called Binder. Um, second shout out of the day is we're gonna give a Binder talk tomorrow. Um, it's heavily overlapping with the Jupyter Hub team as well. So if you wanna play around with mybinder.org, go to that website, um, or you can just come to our talk and, and learn a little bit about it later on. So the challenge that we had was how can we use Jupyter Notebooks as sort of a first class citizen for course content in Data8 and integrate it with something like uh, the Jupyter Hub that we use for the course, but still present those uh, Jupyter Notebooks to people in a textbook-like fashion. Um, and so the result of that is this little project that I've been working on called Textbooks with Jupyter. Um, so what is it? Basically, it is simply a GitHub repository that serves a Jekyll website. Um, it is uh, a collection of custom Jekyll templates, an NB convert template, whatever notebooks you want that serve your textbook, and a little helper script that converts those notebook files into Jekyll markdown. So it's pretty lightweight um, and straightforward, I would say. Um, what it actually looks like in terms of the repository is something like this. Uh, you've got a folder called notebooks, and inside that folder are a bunch of notebooks, maybe organized in chapters or something like this. These are the first couple of notebooks uh, from the uh, Data8 textbook. Um, and a folder called scripts, and that folder just contains some helper scripts to convert them into Jekyll Markdown. And really, that's about it. Um, when you build that and push it to GitHub, which for those of you who don't know, can serve Jekyll websites uh, for free, then you get something like this. So th these are content that lives in that collection of Jupyter Notebooks and Markdown files. You get like a nice sidebar here on the left. You can scroll through it. You can jump forwards and backwards. There's nifty little things like uh, you know, copying code. So a lot of little tiny things that uh, maybe individually aren't super complicated, but when you package it all in this way, is really useful for something like hosting uh, a textbook. Uh, if you are curious, um, you can also see the Data8 textbook, which is a bit more of like a fully complete kind of thing here. Um, and this really, it, it runs through the gamut of lots of different things that you could do. Um, you can, uh, you know, you can embed all of the, uh, let's see if I can randomly pick some good ones here. You can embed the outputs of all of the Jupyter Notebooks and it sort of collects it all and displays it in a nice way. Um, there are also a couple, and I'm not gonna try to hunt for it because I don't know which, but you can do things like embed uh, interactive HTML within the notebook and then it will get rendered on your Jekyll website so that you can give people fully a maps to play with and stuff like that. So if you're curious about this, uh, check out that repository that I sent before. It's designed to be forkable and very quickly modifiable so you can deploy your own textbook. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd love to chat with you further. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for throwing the book at us. Uh, the thing about Jupyter projects is that there are so moony of them. All right, <laughs> we got one I like it from the crowd, so. Thanks, Gil. It was worth it, that's all we need. We run on fumes here. Uh, so for our last talk of the day, uh, I believe it's Alex, right? Yes. Yep. All right. Alex is up, and then we'll have to wait another 23 hours. Okay, so I'm Alex Nunes. I'm from the Ocean Tracking Network up north in uh, Halifax in Canada. And I'm here to talk to you about a uh, project I'm working on and a package. Uh, that animals move throughout the ocean, but they also go down and they come back up and they go down again and they come back up. So what happens is researchers go out and they tag these animals, 
So a bunch of them ethically wrestle these things to the ground and glue the tags onto their heads. Um, so, and these things track both satellite and these depth and temperature and all these different variables, which is great. We also have deep divers and these wonderful sharks who generally go down and try to stay down. So unfortunately, can't really look at these things yet because the algorithm and the package I'm looking for looks more at the surfacing animals, but my hope is to work into non-surfacing animals. And basically what we do is we break down the dive data, this continuous dive data into segments of a single dive at a time. And each of those single dives is broken down into components. And then we've kind of looked into actually classifying these dives and trying to assign them to some sort of animal behavior. Initially, what we looked at was actually comparing it to human classification and figuring out if we could just programmatically do it. That did not work. So what we did is I actually used a glometer of clustering to cluster the dives. So the dives actually got broken down into descent, bottom, ascent, and surface times and periods, break it down into ascent velocities, any sort of skew, left or right, or descent and velocity skew, to create this kind of a, just a general profile, and the depth in there is in meters, by the way. And what happens is we can take those attributes and actually cluster them. And what we found is it's actually really great at clustering. So things like this cluster five, we actually get a lot of surface behavior because we're only going down to about seven meters. However, something like cluster four is we get this kind of like weird right skew dive. And the agglomerate of clustering, which is also goes through principal component analysis because we essentially have 16 attributes going in and we break it down to about eight coming out as well as uses uh, Bayesian criterion to figure out the number of clusters based on the animal's data itself. So this is all animal independent. So it's not built up over time and it's completely unsupervised so we don't have to train any data sets. And each animal probably runs in about seven minutes. So just going through cluster ones, you kind of see these ones have a bit of a, like, a little peak before they come back up. Let's see. Again, cluster three, you get kind of different variants. So this is really exciting because these researchers used to go through these things completely manually, one by one by one, and a seal can actually get about 10,000 dives in the six month period that it's out. And that's, they take about 20 seals every year. So that's a lot of dives to go through manually. And now we're doing it in a matter of minutes per seal. That's it. <laughs> If you have questions, come talk to me, find me out in the crowd, I'll be around. <laughs>